Welcome back to the stage of history, young historians. This is our third lecture video of the semester, and this one is going to be on Chapter 17, The Age of Exploration. But before we even say anything about what is in the chapter, I want to speak about what's strangely absent from a chapter called The Age of Exploration and that is the contributions to exploration by non-European explorers, in particular the Chinese. At the beginning of the time that this chapter studies, the 15th century, Chinese Admiral Zheng He was exploring the entire Pacific Ocean and doing so with fleets and ships that quite frankly dwarfed European ships at the same time. He was also doing so with, with much greater precision than Europeans were, and there's little way that you could honestly look at the 15th century and not say that the Chinese were equal to, if not better than, European explorers. So it is important that we point out that bit of selection bias on the part of our textbook here. We're studying the European age of exploration in chapter 17. There, fixed it. So what we're going to be looking at when we study chapter 17 in class is going to be European exploration into the New World, Africa, and to some extent India. Our main focus will be on the Americans, Americas in class, but it's important that we remember how important India was to the age of exploration, and we'll also take a peek at Africa a few, a few times. I'll see if I can't put together a couple of resources for us as well on European colonies in India. We're dealing with the birth of a transcontinental economy here, but our lenses, for this chapter at least, are going to remain European. We'll get some Asian perspectives, though, coming up in a few weeks in chapters 19 and 20. So, our table of contents. This chapter is three lessons long, rather than the two lesson long chapters that you started off the year with. Lesson one was, again, appropriately titled for this chapter in focusing on European exploration and expansion. What I want to take a look at is the first subsection of that lesson, the factors that produce the age of European exploration. The elementary school version is the phrase that they give you in there, glory, God, and gold. I tell you what, it's high school, I'm going to make it even easier on us. I'm going to narrow it down to just two terms. I want to talk about the novelty and the necessity of European exploration. Produce the first global economic systems. Truly an interesting and important topic for us to be studying. Probably the meatiest of the three lessons in here, probably the meatiest of the ones that we have done so far this year, dealing with the roots of the mercantile school of thought that will dominate European economics for the next 250 years. We'll introduce mercantilism, and what I want to hit on in that section is some of the ways in which standards of living were changing in Europe during the late 15th and early 16th century, and offer at least a few plausible explanations as to why those standards of living were changing. After that, a look at the effects that the transatlantic trade had not on Europe, but instead on the... on not on Europe or the Americas, excuse me, but instead the effect that the transatlantic trade, the Colombian exchange, had on Africa, the occasionally forgotten third partner in that uh, exchange. A brief look at the kingdom of Benin and the city of Ouida, which became one of the major ports for slave traders on Africa's west coast, the area that would eventually become known as the Slave Coast. Lastly, for lesson three, I want to enrich the book's coverage of Latin American society by taking a look at a style of art from the time period that will inform us a little bit about the racial caste systems in Latin America after the arrival of Europeans and Africans in the 1490s. That's where we're going. Come sail away with me, kids. So the age of exploration. There's a whole mess of reasons that we can point to as for why it is that Europeans started taking to the seas and exploring other continents in greater numbers in the 15th century. In asking why that happens in the late 15th century and not the 13th or the 17th, there's really two simple explanations that we can point to, and as I think you'll find out I'm implying in this presentation, there's one that I like better. One idea is that they were doing it because they could. The other is that they were doing it because they had to. 
And while de how I'll delineate these is the two words like that I used on the previous slide, novelty and necessity, I'll call them. One way of understanding this that this is that this is was something that happened because now it could and it wouldn't have been possible at any earlier point in history. The this there being the age of exploration, being crossing the Atlantic. It was new, it was a novelty, and any argument there is going to focus on the changes in technology that were going on in the time period. Now, your textbook points to a number of changes to ships themselves that made them more seaworthy at this point in history. In particular, it points to the Portuguese caravel as being the ship design that made transcontinental sailing possible for Europeans. And this is true. It was the design of lighter, faster, more maneuverable ships that made the type of sailing that the Spanish and Portuguese did during the Age of Exploration possible. But it was hardly brand new at the time. Uh, caravel is a Latin word. It's a, well, it's a word derived from the Latin word carabus, a word that the Romans only needed because they had them. They had ships that were very similar in overall design, if not actual quality, to the caravel that would be used during the Age of Exploration. Ships similar to this caravel had been used as early as the 3rd century BC. So in inventing the caravel, the Portuguese are mostly reinventing the wheel. Latine sails, a shallow hull that allows you to maneuver and explore coastal waters, yeah, these things are necessary for exploration, but they're not new technologies, they're just new applications of old technology. European shipbuilding is getting better during this time, but it's not getting radically different. The other place where your book points towards in talking about improving technology is in improvements in navigation and cartography, and in particular they point to the compass. And again, that's not wrong, although the compass is every bit as old as the Latine sail and the caravel. Your book mentions that the compass is a Chinese discovery. It doesn't mention that that discovery was sometime around 200 BC, although for the first several hundred years it was mostly used as a toy and a gimmick uh, used for divination before ultimately being applied to navigation. Europeans actually gain access to the compass sometime in the Middle Ages, about 1100 or so, but what they invented closer to the time of exploration is something called the dry compass, a compass where the magnetic pointy doohickey doesn't need to be suspended in fluid in order to work. That's invented somewhere around 1300, and that is much more handy for use on board a ship. Why is it then that it's not until 1420 that the Portuguese kick off our age of exploration by sailing up and down the Af west coast of Africa? I mean, people are lazy, but they're not wait around for 120 years before you try a new invention lazy. Technologies were improving during the Age of Exploration, to be sure, but if we actually want to explain why it is that there was a change in European behavior in 1420 or so, then we're going to need to have something better than the fact that Europeans started using ancient boats and a tool they'd had for 120 years to cover the globe. We're going to need to look at something other than just the technology and the novelty of it, because like I said, there's not a ton that is really brand new here. The real reason I would argue that Europeans left the continent is because they needed to. It was not novelty, it was not, oh, because we can now, it was out of necessity. It was a political and economic necessity, and it was probably most closely correlated to the rise of the Ottoman Empire in modern-day Turkey. The Ottoman Empire, one of the Islamic empires that we'll be studying in Chapter 19, once looked like that. Oh, I'm sorry, the Ottoman Empire once looked like that. Ah, it's more dramatic when you have to wait for it. <laughs> uh, yes, the Ottoman Empire once looked like this. And then in 1450, the Ottoman Empire looked like this.
And having an empire like the Ottomans there in Asia Minor, and in particular in the area of Constantinople, there at the Bosporus and the Dardanelles, meant that trading for Asian goods in the nearest part of Asia was no longer viable for Europeans. The costs of goods, both luxury goods and necessity goods, were increasing because the Ottomans taxed trade with Europeans so heavily. Europeans never would have gotten on a boat and taken off to the high seas if it wasn't an economic necessity. By the time that the Ottoman Empire finally ends up looking like this, you can imagine why it is that seafaring becomes imperative for the Europeans. It was either that or pay Ottoman prices, which they couldn't afford to pay. That's why it was imperative for Europeans, as a collective, as a people, to explore foreign trade and colonial options. But what was it that motivated individual Europeans to take up the less than glamorous life that was 15th century seafaring? We'll read a journal entry that will spoil your lunch that day and make you never want to sail ever. Well, in a lot of cases, it had to do with the religious conflicts that we looked at in chapter 16. You want to avoid persecution? You want to set up your religious utopia somewhere else? Hop on a boat, buddy, and float away from some religious wars and off to somewhere where you can either be left alone or convert the heathens to your ways depending on your individual religion's preferences. It's how many English groups got to the modern-day United States. It's how thousands of Jews ended up in Jamaica, of all places, even though the Spanish Empire did explicitly forbid Jews from settling in the New World, that was pretty easy for them to cover up by claiming to be converts. Hmm. The rebirth of Roman ideas making something new possible. Religious conflicts sparking political and social changes. It's almost as if all these chapters connect in some way, or shape or form. Hmm. Think about all these connections, young historians. Y'all are going to have a paper coming up. Once Europeans do start to explore and expand, however, there's going to be a radical change in how European economies function. When you keep in mind that this is also a time not too far removed from the creation of a reliable, consistent currency, it's really a seismic shift in how wealth and money worked. We'll try to wrap our heads around some of that in class. It's one of those places where the past really does become a foreign country to us. And one of the fundamental items that we are going to be looking at is going to be trying to understand the economies in this era's doctrine of mercantilism. Now, mercantilism is not a singular economic policy. It's an entire way of looking at economies. It's an entire economic school of thought. And to give us the background on mercantilism we need, I've always found it helpful to break it down into these three fundamental assumptions that mercantilism makes. Number one, the way you measure a nation's wealth is its supply of gold and silver. Precious metal currency determines that nation's wealth. I've had a lot of people just kind of snore at this thought, thinking it's obvious, but it's actually a fairly flawed notion if we think about it. A nation's wealth is determined by far more than that. It's determined by its labor pool, by its resources, by its connections, but the mercantile school of thought says that those are all an end, or a means to the end of more currency. Maximize the influx of gold and silver. That's the name of the game in mercantilism. A fundamental assumption of mercantilism number two, then, is that, and it's very much tied to the first one, since there's only so much precious metal on the planet, only so much gold and silver to go around, you're going to need to set up shop elsewhere as well. Nations should maximize their revenue by establishing colonies and then redirecting all of the colonial trade there to the mother, co the mother country. Leading to an economic strategy where, doctrine part number three, nations export their raw goods and finished goods they sell both their resources and their finished wares, although with a heavy emphasis in mercantile philosophy on selling the finished goods, since those will get you more gold and silver back, in exchange for currency gold and silver. Again, the idea is hoard the gold and silver, get all of the currency poured into your nation's economy. Now, from this basic philosophy comes a whole score of practices. 
prohibiting the importation of foreign goods into your country because you don't want their goods, you want their money. When you do import foreign goods, only import raw goods so that you can then finish them yourselves and then sell them for money. All things to keep the supply of currency high. Not surprisingly, then, this is going to lead to a lot of gold ending up in the Spanish Empire. If you take a look at the chart from your book, somewhat predictably, though, you do eventually hit a critical mass. Take a look at this chart from your book. The importation of gold hits a peak in 1551 through 1560. This peak is actually a bit before the Spanish Empire begins its decline. Their decline doesn't start until about 1588 with the sinking of the Spanish Armada. Well, well before the Armada was sunk, the mercantile system was already beginning to sputter. Why? Well, there's only but so much gold in the world, for one thing, but it also deals with the profitability of other manners of setting up colonies, in particular the British colonial model, quite simply besting the pure mercantile model of the Spaniards. All in all, our takeaway should be that European economies were changing during this time period, and not in some small way either. Not only were they changing for the wealthy, those who were concerned about policies of mercantilism, but they were changing for the people as well. There's a glimmer of hope here for the poor. Take a look at this data from the end of the 15th century in Brussels, Belgium, and the surrounding areas. In 1480, 27% of the, census, uh, the centri census entries, the individual family entries in the census, were reported as being so poor that they had no income worth taxing. Well, in 1496, that number has fallen to 19% and would stay there for most of the beginning of the 16th century. We can look at other data as well, from England and from Italy, uh, so a pretty good cross-section of Europe that we're dealing with here, that shows that during this time period, real wages for laborers, in particular they looked at stonemasons, so a good indication of a basic labor job, stabilized during the 15th and early 16th century, and stabilized at a rate that was 20% higher than where it was in the 1450s. The standard of living was also increasing for the lower class in Europe. And it had little to do with mercantilism. What I think it had a lot more to deal with is population, and it had a lot more to deal with demographics. In the wake of the plague and religious warfare, famine, the works, total populations actually end up decreasing in Europe from 1300 to 1400, and will stay lower than they were in the 1200s. Fewer living people is bad if you're one of the ones who dies, but it's actually kind of a sweet gig if you're one of the ones who stays alive because it means more employment, more land, more resources, a larger piece of the pie, and it's not just true in England shown here in the chart, but in Europe as a whole as well, with the population dropping to about 60 million in the 1400s and 1500s before increasing again, a change that we will also be studying as populations tend to do. It's very rare that you see a drop in true population level like this. Populations are almost always increasing. Although the European population isn't the only place that sees a decline in its population during this time, and in Africa the population hit doesn't come with an increasing standard of living, it comes with warfare and poverty. Taking a look at Africa, in particular, the Kingdom of Benin and the city of Ouida, seen here in the image in the background. Benin is, a, is particularly selected by your textbook as an example of the worst of the worst as far as the impact that the slave, tra tra the slave trade had on Africa itself. The Kingdom of Benin, slightly different from the modern-day nation of Benin, but still situated in the same general part of Africa, we're talking about the southern shore of the west coast, the area that would become to be known as the Slave Coast during the centuries of the slave trade. The Kingdom of Benin was first established in 1300 and first encountered Europeans when Prince Henry the Navigator's Portuguese arrived in 1486. 
the people of Benin pick up Portuguese pretty quickly and they begin profitable trade with Europeans. In particular, they start trading pepper and ivory, which were two local goods that the Kingdom of Benin had a monopoly on. And they trade cloth with the Portuguese in exchange for copper and brass. Copper and brass, which the metal workers of Benin were pretty able, were actually much better able to turn into finished goods than Europeans of the time. When it came to metalworking, Africa was really where it was at in the 1500s. The trade's actually pretty beneficial to Benin until the start, the trading of human beings begins with the slave trade that will dominate the economy from 1486 through 1807. See, the Spanish are the ones who start the demand for the slave trade because they needed workers for the Americas and the natives weren't resistant to European diseases, meaning that they died in mass under Spanish rule. So if they wanted laborers, they needed Africans. That's a grotesque oversimplification of the situation, but your text gives something of a longer explanation of slavery's roots and we'll look at some of that in class. Ouida, though, the city that becomes uh, synonymous with the slave trade in Benin, a southern port of Benin with its uh, path to nowhere, its gate to nowhere scene in the image here, becomes one of the major ports from which Africans are trafficked. Many of the Africans sold into slavery being pris were prisoners of local wars at first, but ultimately slavery becomes a market with upwards of 10,000 people a year being sold into slavery in Benin, in particular going through the city of Ouida here throughout the 1700s. It got to a point where in the 1700s, Benin had to abolish the selling of males into slavery because their population was no longer capable to sustain its own needs. And it's not just Africans being snatched up and sent off to the Americas here, it's also inner African uh, slave trade that occurs with Benin ultimately importing slaves from other parts of Africa to sell internally, particularly in Ghana. At the peak of the slave trade, enslaved people were the number one exports for the leaving the city of Benin. There's an interesting and moving report on the gate that you see here in the back that was done by the BBC. If you're at all interested in this topic, I'll post a link to, the, to it in the description for the video and you can check it out. I'm also going to ask that you tuck this name of this city, Ouida, into the back of your mind. It'll come up again in a few weeks in a story that's one of my favorites and really one of the most dramatic revenge stories in history. For now though, your book gives us the quick summarizing quote from the Dutch slaver who looked around and lamented that the African civilization he knew on the slave coast went from being a community with skilled metal workers and art to being the den of sin and evil within only a generation or so, saying that Europeans had taught them nothing but strife, quarreling, drunkenness, trickery, theft, unbridled desire for what was not one's own, misdeeds unknown to them before, and the accursed lust of gold. I love how, love how he saves that one for last, the real thunder here. This will be far from the only time that European interference in Africa leaves the Africans wishing that the Mediterranean was, you know, just a little bit wider. But the transatlantic slave trade certainly among, was among the most culturally devastating activities in which humanity ever engaged. <laughs> Lastly, a word about society in Latin America. Now, what that word Latin America even means can be a slippery topic for us. If we say it's Central and South America, that leaves out a good number of Caribbean islands. If we say that it includes the Caribbean then, then there's certainly islands there that don't count as being Latin. If we try to label it then as being the Spanish language, we'll have to cut out Brazil. If we try to label it as being anything that's derived from a Romance language, well then we need to start including Montreal. It's really a tough region to define, so for the moment we'll just go with most of Central and South America, but acknowledge that the distinction there is imprecise. 
Anyways, at right, we have a form of art that was unique to Latin America. What you see here is not a comic book, as I so often hear guessed. It's what we would call a Costa painting. Costa, as in cast. You'll remember India's rigid caste system from your studies last year with Miss Chopra, the idea that race is indicative of social standing and determines one's class. Well, that's easy to do in some societies, but in Latin America during this time in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries, we see that the introduction of two brand new races, Europeans and Africans, are in these two new races are introduced into a previously homogenous ethnic landscape. Within generations, just a few generations, a caste system of its own starts to form, and you see that legacy in your text's vocabulary for Chapter 17, Lesson 3. Vocabulary like mulatto, mestizo, all manner of terms for the potential different combinations of races. But how do you keep them all straight? Well, enter the cast Costa painting. Created in different regions, Costa paintings showed the different combinations of races and what their offspring might look like. More than just a picture of what a child might look like, though, and what the local term for that child might be, these paintings also showed what lifestyles looked like for people in that ethnic group. Usually with the aristocratic Europeans, the peninsulares, shown upwards towards the top, higher on the list, and mixed races ending up further down on the list, and you can see a descending quality of life as you look further down on that list. For instance, we can take a look at one Costa painting here, and we see the text from the image reads, from a black man and an Amerindian woman, or a uh, negro e india, it says on there, sabe un lobo, a mixture, they get a combination out of that that they call a lobo, a wolf. And that wasn't the only animalistic name that was given, a uh, mestizo and an Indian. Well, that three-quarters native mix, that's going to be referred to as a coyote. To some extent, the Costa painting is a symbol of the systemic racism that dominated Latin American culture under colonial rule. We can see the direct line between race and wealth. We can see that certain groups are being labeled with potentially racist, animalistic names like wolf and coyote. But there's something else that we need to remember about these paintings, and that is that there was a word for everything. Your 3 16 white, 5 16 Indian, and half black? Oh yeah, we've got one of those. There's a name for that. There's a name for everything in these Costa paintings. And with the exception of unicorns and the platypus, we don't usually come up with names for things that don't exist. So while there was a rigid class system, yes, these paintings show us that romantic and familial bonds blurred those lines and gave us very rich and complex culture, one that led to a lot of mixing of races, and one that I look forward to studying in class with you in the coming week plus. That's all for this episode. Until next time, true believers.